Hello everybody. It's Father's Day today, so hopefully you said Happy Father's Day to our Heavenly Father, because I have. And I'd like to honor him today with the study of his word. And I'd like for us to all learn together in Jesus' name, because that's what it's all about. That's what the whole many-member body of Christ is all about, is to come together as one in his name. And as the old proverb goes, iron sharpens iron. And we need to sharpen our iron with one another to do battle against Satan, because that's who the war is with. It's not with each other. It's not with other Christians that are deceived. You being one of God's elect, you're supposed to be standing for them because they don't know any better. They don't know that they should be ashamed. They think what they're doing is right. And you and I, well, if you understand the word of God, you know better. So that's the whole purpose of us being delivered up to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. But anyhow, with this study, I'm going to look deeper into the word of God and what was uh, what took place in Luke chapter 4. Because remember, everything that Satan does when he comes here is a cheap fabric imitation of what Jesus Christ already did when he was here. And there was something that is not really commonly taught in Luke chapter 4, and I find it fascinating, and I would just love to share it with you guys. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. But for this, I want to start in Revelation chapter 6 and lay the foundation. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now for me, in the English, I would think this would be a, a man on a white horse with a bow and arrow in his hand, but that's not what the word bow is in the Greek. It's the word talks on. And the word talks on means a cheap fabric imitation. Now this is Satan when he's cast out of heaven to this earth. He's a cheap fabric imitation of our Lord and Savior. He is literally going to claim that he is Jesus Christ. But it's a cheap fabric imitation. So he's going to imitate everything that Jesus Christ did during his ministry. Why? Because he wants to kill everybody that he can to drag them down with him. Because understand, this is the wrath of God. God sending Satan here is God's wrath. Because God is not happy with his church and all the false doctrines and everything else. And he's going to find out who loves him and who doesn't. And he's going to stick this fraud in front of us all. Now, God's elect, you already know better. You should already be prepared in your mind with the seal of God in your forehead, waiting to be delivered up to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. So perhaps your brothers and sisters can snap out of their spin and get the right garments on, which better be sackcloth and ashes. Because that's what you're going to have upon you. But really, in our Father's eyes, you're white as snow, just as beautiful as can be. But when Satan is here and we're in his satanic kingdom, you are the transgressor. He turns everything upside down and backwards. So let's go to Luke chapter 4. Let's get into it a little deeper. Because Jesus did something that is uh, pretty incredible here. Well, everything he did is incredible, but... For me, studying and learning as I go, like we all do, sometimes something just catches your eye. <clears throat> this is immediately after the baptism of John and Jesus is about to begin his ministry. And the first thing that he did was went to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Now 40 in biblical numerics is probation. And that's exactly what is going to happen to us when Satan is cast here to this earth. We're going to be under probation. Satan is going to use the same tactics against us that he used against Jesus Christ. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit onto the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward a hungered. When we're on probation, you had better not eat anything that Satan has to offer. Understand, there's more than one meaning to everything in the Word of God, and food has twofold meaning. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. His Word is the hidden manna that we are partaking of right now. But at this time, when Satan comes claiming that he's Jesus Christ, you had better be fasting. 
just like Jesus was. But he literally fasted. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 8 here. I'm not going to go into those chapters, but if you want to know what he's saying here, that's where you can find it. And the devil take him up to a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Yet yeah, you betcha. God has given Satan this power to come down here and deceive the world and give them everything that they want. Those that are deceived and that will worship him. He has that authority. And that's exactly what he's going to do when we're getting to that. If thou therefore, therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. That applies to you. You know that, right? That Satan's going to offer you everything. He's going to offer everybody everything to worship him. And then you take that beautiful robe that you have upon you and you put on the robe of a harlot that you can read of in Revelation chapter 18. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. See, Satan knows the scriptures. He knows the scriptures very well. He knows exactly what is going on. Now what's he doing here? He's trying to get Jesus to kill himself. That's what he's literally trying to do. He said, jump off here. He's uh, misquoting Psalms 91. And Satan, when he comes here, in the beginning, he's going to twist the scriptures. He's going to offer peace and prosperity thee to all in the attempt to do what? To get you to kill yourself. How? By worshiping him. Because if Jesus returns at the seventh trumpet and he finds you with child, wearing a harlot's robe, you weren't faithful and you killed yourself. Spiritually speaking, of course, watch the last study to understand. There's a positive and a negative. Many figures of speech, analogies, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Like I say, he's trying to get Jesus to jump off this high place and kill himself. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Yet yeah, the moment that Satan appears, we read here later on, the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter was asleep and suddenly he woke up and saw Jesus transformed into a spiritual body along with Moses and Elijah. Now, most Christians are sleeping spiritually right now. And they're going to see Jesus and Moses and Elijah standing there. But it's not Jesus and Moses and Elijah. It's Satan and his fallen angels. And he's going to go about teaching throughout the cities. And the fame of him is going to be all over the world. This is the first half an hour, not the second half. We're going to get to that too. Because it's written in Daniel chapter 9. He makes a covenant with many for one week. It didn't say half a week. It said one week. So hopefully all of us brothers and sisters can get on the same page. And you bet, when Satan comes here claiming that he's Jesus, the fame of him is going to go all around the world, right through the electric toilet, the internet, everything else. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place wherein it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this isn't commonly taught, but you know what Jesus is doing here? He's proclaiming a jubilee. Go read Leviticus chapter 25. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 15 to understand these things. He's going to proclaim a jubilee to free us of all the debts, to return people's inheritances, to take it to modern day English. He's going to pay for everybody's houses. He's going to release them from all the debt usury that he's put them in through his four hidden dynasties of education, economics, politics, and religion. Satan's hidden power structure that the sons of Cain put us in bondage in. Now, do you think this is going to go over real well with the sons of Cain that sit there in the seat of Moses claiming that they're God's chosen people? Do you think they were teaching them about the Jubilee and releasing them from their debts? That's exactly what Jesus just stated here. And he's reading from Isaiah chapter 61. This is what's known as the gap theory. And this study is going to carry on into a second and probably a third and probably a fourth. Because when you love your father and you try, your cup overflows. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Yeah, I guess they would be. And he began to say unto them, This day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Now what has Jesus done so far? He's put a tune in into Satan, and he's about to tear up his stronghold. He's about to expose the sons of Cain for who they are. He's about to raise the priesthood from the dead. Christianity cannot be stopped at this point. Satan knows it. And sons of Cain, they thought they, when they crucified him, that was going to be the end of him. Well, guess what? It hasn't been. Christianity has grown and grown to become the Christian nations, the most powerful nations on earth. But there's nothing new under the sun. And we're basically right back to where we started with the sons of Cain back in the seat of Moses again. Literally claiming that they're God's chosen people. And all of us are walking around in a daze, not knowing any better, saying, oh, you best bless the Jews or you're going to be cursed. God will curse you. He'll get you. <clears throat> and all bore him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widow widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Serapita, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, or sorry, Elijah and Elijah, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all that they were in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him onto the brow of a hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Why do you suppose the sons of Cain would want to kill Jesus at this point when he just proclaimed a jubilee because they had quite a money-making racket going on at that time and they wanted the people in bondage. Do you think they wanted them released on the 50th year, seven Sabbaths? Like the law stated, they were sitting there claiming that they are the law and the teachers of the law. Of course they didn't. Well, guess what? When Satan comes here, he's going to proclaim a jubilee. He's going to release everybody from their debts and their bondage that he's placed them in. Why? So he can cause them to be put to death just like he is. Because that's what he is. He's nothing but death. Same thing with his fallen angels. They're going to be destroyed in five months. The moment that they get here, they're done in five months. So you better be prepared to go through shame. Did Jesus say, you're going to be hated for my name's sake? They're all going to be decked out having a great wonderful time. And you're the transgressor. You're the Satan worshiper. 
at that time. You will have sackcloth and ashes upon you, but in our Father's eye, you're whiter than snow. <clears throat> Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. So let's hammer this point here. I'm expecting when Satan gets here, he's not just appearing in Jerusalem in the midst of the week. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, he says he makes a covenant with many for one week. That's the whole week. The deception begins at the very beginning. I'm going to start with verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found in, anymore in heaven. Yeah, I'm sure Satan and his angels are kicking and screaming, not wanting to be thrown out here to the earth. Do you think they're, Satan's looking forward to his thousand-year prison sentence? Do you think those angels are looking forward to being blotted out? Yet when they get here, they're going to make the most out of the situation. That's to drag you down with them to shame you because they hate you especially if you're working against them doing battle against him and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceived the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him the fifth trumpet has sounded the first woe trumpet satan is here going through the streets preaching and teaching and the fame of him is going to grow then he's going to proclaim a jubilee to release the people from all the debts. And when Jesus did that, they wanted to kill him. Well, when Satan does that, they're going to love him. Remember, everything's turned upside down and backwards. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. If you ever wondering what Satan's doing right now, he's accusing you day and night. Every time you sin and make a mistake, he's right there accusing you like the hypocrite that he is. That's why we must repent often in Jesus' name because we all sin in ignorance or not. We're not perfect like Jesus. We never will be. That was the whole point of Jesus paying the price is so we could be perfect in his eyes through our repentance and our love for him. That's it. That's what makes you clean. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. These are Christians we're talking about here, more specifically, God's elect. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a times from the face of the serpent. This is the first half hour we're talking about here and how you nourished. You should already be nourished in God's word. You should already see these things and expect these things to happen. Everybody else, not so much. And there's no point in trying to tell everybody at that point that that isn't Jesus Christ's Satan because they're just not going to listen to you. Just like the first time the dove was released from Noah's Ark, it brought nothing back. But the second time they had the olive branch back in its mouth. Why? Because you're going to be delivered up and the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you. <clears throat> and the fact that the serpent is mentioned here takes you right back into the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden? What did our Father say? The day that you eat of that fruit, of that tree, you're going to die. Now what did Satan do? He twisted God's word to do what? To seduce Eve. It took the twisting of God's word first to get the idea in her forehead to commit the sin and consummate the sin. You look at that the last half an hour. First half an hour, the twisting of God's word. Second half an hour, the consummation of the sin. 
when they are with child and giving suck in those days and not barren like Jesus told us to be barren in the last study. This isn't complicated, isn't it? Or is it? Doesn't it make sense? If it didn't make sense, it wouldn't make sense. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away with the flood. What flood? The flood of lies. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now is the earth literally going to open up and swallow up a flood? No, this is obviously symbolism. I heard it taught that we are made of the earth. And remember what Jesus said? It's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. It means the information that goes into you. It just go If you have the truth of God's word in your forehead, those lies just go in one side and right out the other side. They don't stay in between your ears, or at least they shouldn't. You should already be well prepared and well taught with the gospel armor on and in place ready to do battle at that time. Waiting to be delivered up to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And we know this takes place in the second half an hour. The first half an hour, just sit back and watch. Because that's all you're going to be able to do. <clears throat> and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's you, God's elect. You guys have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do not premeditate what you shall speak because it's not going to be you that speaks. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. That sets the time. They're asking him about a second advent and the end of the world. It can't be messed with. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Start verse 23 because you're going to give it you're given another vintage or <coughs> another version of things like God keeps hammering the point over and over and over with various different aspects object lessons he you know he's foretold us all things we're not left in famine like everybody else <clears throat> So this is a vision of when Satan gets cast to this earth, claiming that he's Jesus Christ. Now let's hear what he's going to do. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have come to the full, while we're getting there, look around today. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. This is Satan claiming that he's Jesus Christ. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. No, he's going to twist the word of God. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to claim to be Jesus Christ. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Well, how is he going to do that? Through liberty. Proclaim a jubilee, Satan. Pay off everybody's debts. Can you imagine what that will do to the world today? People will literally be tripping over themselves like a bunch of bulls running down a street so they can get there to worship him and get their pay on. Get them some of that money. They'll get real holy right real quick. There'll be no such thing as atheists at that time. Oh, they'll be crying. Oh, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me. I didn't know. There, there. I forgive you. Here, have some of my money. Why? Because he knows he has a short time. He wants to destroy as many people as he can. And the things that are highly esteemed amongst men are an, ab an abomination to God. There's nothing more abominable than what's going to take place. <clears throat> and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall be destroyed many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Yep, yeah, as soon as the seven trumpet sounds, as soon as the two witnesses are killed in Jerusalem, that's it. Those 7,000 fallen angels, Satan's elect, are going to be destroyed right then and there. Their sentence is carried out. Satan's going into the abyss to be made a gazing stock for a thousand years. You can read of that in Isaiah chapter 14. And if you be of God's elect, 
Hopefully you don't commit the unpardonable sin because, like I said, maybe Satan will have a bunk bed there and you'll be on the top bunk so everybody can gaze at you. Now it's time to get humble, not get raised up in pride and argue and get in a competition. I'm not in a competition with anybody. I wish somebody would take this stuff and do something with it. Let's finish this up. Daniel chapter 9. I'm just going to read verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The cup of wrath. And what to say? He says he makes a covenant with many for one week. Not just half a week, the whole week. This is what the Word of God says. <clears throat> and I'm not a Hebrew and Greek scholar, but I looked up this word oblation, and it has to do with the free will offerings, not the blood offerings. The free will offerings was the way under the law that the people could show their love and reverence towards God. He's going to cause that to cease because He wants your love. And in order for him to get your love you're gonna to have to worship him simple as that remember he's God there is no other God but me remember everything that he does is a cheap fabric imitation of what Jesus Christ already did but it's the exact opposite if you're a Christian you go from being buried or yeah you go from dying to being buried and resurrected in baptism to go from resurrected resurrected to buried to dead it's the exact opposite Everything is the exact opposite. Full of the names of blasphemy. There's much more to this. This is just the first part. I've got to do some more studying to build on this. The whole point is, is you're going to be wearing sackcloth upon you. And that directs you right to the book of Lamentations. Because that's written for this time through the hidden acrostics of 11. 11, 11, everybody's all make a wish on 11, 11. 11 is judgment and disorder. And the book is full of the acrostics of 11 for that purpose. Because it's written to this generation. And you of God's elect are going to be the ones with sackcloth upon you. Like it is written in Revelation chapter 11. Why? For lamentations. Do you not care about anybody else other than yourself? Think about it. If you're going to claim to be the church of brotherly love, prove it. I love you guys, and I'm going to do a study soon.